Okay, back for another video, and this one is going gangbusters, man. I've had a lot of comments on these uh, on these videos. I'm trying to do a series. I'm still stuck on the first one, really, except that I did one on some comments I got. Well, looks like I'm going to do it again. I've got a lot more comments and a lot more information to cover. So anyway, <laughs> as I said here, it took me five minutes to figure out how to say I got more comments. I got another video of the video of the comments of the comments. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're good responses, uh, mostly. <laughs> Some accusations, whatever. Okay, so I'm going to start first um, by thanking everybody for the comments, even though, even if it's done in vitriol, it helps me be more like Jesus. Anyway, there's a quote here about RNA. We're going to get into RNA a lot, a bit, a lot in this uh, video because that's what was brought up. So anyway, I just want, this is a quote that I put in there. It's, I didn't make this up. Anyway, a research group at the, uh, Bosentrum University of Basel has developed a new method to measure the half-life of RNA molecules. A study revealed that commonly used methods provide distorted results, distorted results, and that RNA molecules live an average of only two minutes, ten times shorter than previously assumed. Two minutes, okay? You got two minutes to build that cell. Two minutes, anyway. Uh, here's another quote I want you to keep in mind as we go through this, okay? Now, if you look at the quote, look at the second paragraph, over to the, over to the right, it starts with the word, we are. It says, we are forced by our, and I started my quote there, and then I was accused of the fallacy of quote mining, so I put the whole quote. Here's a quote. And it, it's worse for the atheist anyway, so here's the whole quote. And then when I get done, I want you to keep it in mind. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of, the, of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not the methods and institutions of science Listen to that. It is not the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation, materialism of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations only, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism must be absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. <laughs> so, I'm going to briefly cover this. Uh, I was, I was going to take a little more time on, again, on... Um, information theory, but I'm not going to really spend a whole lot of time. We already talked about it. Now, in the comments, we went with the, the atheist. I went round and round about um, the information theory. And just as I predicted, just as I predicted. Now, when I was attacked about it before, they, you know, tried to, uh, again, I like David Berlinski, but David Berlinski, is, you know, at least leans towards intelligent design. So what? Again, he's an agnostic Jew. Anyway, they tried to pin the concept on him. Well, in this this one, they're going to try. They try to pin it on William Dembski, and we went round and round about that. So, and then over to the left, these are the these are the types of information that they can find in nature, and and in their minds, they think that this kind of information right here can bring about uh, complex life. Nonsense. Okay, so. You just go back. If you haven't read it, go back and read them. I'm, I'm not going to do all that. Do all these things convey some information? Sure. But they're patterns. <laughs> they're just patterns. Even a chemical reaction, like I say here, is a pattern. And you hope it's a pattern. You know why? Because when you put two and two, two chemicals together, you hope they give you the same reaction every single time. Because if you don't, we couldn't do chemistry. But that's just simple chemistry. And that's what, what, that's what chemistry means. Okay? So... I give you here uh, a couple of uh, examples and definitions of Shannon information versus uh, specified complex. But so you can read those; it's fine. But what I want you to understand is the the atheists in the room. They again they tried to pin it on William Dembski in 1998, I believe, whatever his book was. Well, that's not true. It came. It's 52 years old. The idea is 52 years old, and it was introduced by a Darwinist. A Darwinist, okay? He believes in Darwin, he, and he, believe it or not, he was talking about RNA. 
but you would you know I could not get one atheist to agree to it. Did William Dembski bring it up in his work too? Sure. Now, the information, the type of information we're talking about in this talk is, I'll tell you what type of information it is. And this is an example from evolution. Do you understand? From the evolutionists, I don't know, when I was younger, and I've been doing this a long time debating this stuff, this is a stupid, the, the stupid example they always gave. How long would it take one million monkeys? And it may not have been one million. I may be exaggerating. Maybe 50,000 monkeys. I don't care. Whatever it was. How long would it take one million monkeys typing on typewriters to randomly type out of all of William Shakespeare? Well, William Shakespeare is specified and complex <laughs> because it's written text. How long would it take? It's your example, not mine. Okay. Now, my main question has been, it still continues to be, it seems like the atheists really can't answer it. I said, and, and again, this is based upon what Lee Cronin said. He's an origin of life scientist. All I want is a number. Explain first how much information was needed for first life according to the list we were given, and then how much, how that information was coded into the first cell so that it could replicate. You got to have both. You can't just say, oh, there was information in it. <laughs> okay, whatever. And then her, the response was, the question has no answer. Now, that's probably the most honest answer I've gotten all night, uh, the, this, whole, this whole time. There is no answer. From an atheistic perspective, there is no answer. It is too complex. And that's a fact. And you'll never find the answer just believing that it's material causes. There's no answer. And they're accusing me of trying to put nature into clearly uh, demarked boxes. Really? No, it wasn't me. It was Lee Cronin who showed a cell and said, look, this is a cell. This is the smallest form of life that we know of. Why? And he said it because it can replicate. Now, can a virus replicate? We, we talked about that. But a virus needs the host. It does not have its own DNA, RNA, it uses a host. Okay. So I told him, watch the first um, video in the series. <laughs> Lee Cronin and Eugene Coonan. They're both on your side. In fact, they threw, they threw Carl Sagan under the bus. They threw Richard Dawkins under the bus. They threw everybody under the bus. It's funny. You guys are impeaching your own witnesses. That's funny. You go to court with these witnesses. They're on your side and you impeach every one of them. That's pretty funny. But you know what the real problem is? The problem is, good for me, the science is on my side now. A little cell. The smallest cell you can think of. The most basic cell you can think of for minimal life. It's a trillion times more complex than the space shuttle. That's why in this video you'll see what did they do. Well, they had to redefine everything and muddy the waters. Now, is the information stored in DNA complex, simplified complex, uh, specified complex, or is it not? Well, looky here. DNA is capable of storing 215 petabytes. That's 215 million gigabytes in a single gram of DNA. The system could, in principle, store every bit of datum ever recorded by humans in a container about the size and weight of a couple of pickup trucks. We are very excited about this newer, more scalable approach to making DNA a competitive alternative information storage medium. We have made significant advances in both the encoding and decoding platforms. Wow! Now that sounds like computer code to me. And I'm a computer expert. That's my background. And you know, that sounds exactly like what I do in computers. And, and again, the wishy-washy atheist. All they could do was say, no, it's just looking for outcome. It's just looking for outcome nonsense stuff. It was just nonsense. Go read it yourself. You can go read the stuff that they wrote. Um, the information in the DNA, too, is primary, and it's independent of the chemistry. Let me say that again. The information is independent of the chemistry. Well, how do I know? Well, based on what you just saw. And I use this example for, for the, the people on the other side. I said, look, if you wanted to, you could put the Windows OS in a DNA molecule. The same DNA molecule, mind you. Or you can erase it and put it in a Mac OS. You put the Mac OS in there. Or you could erase it and put the Linux OS in there. It has nothing to do with the chemistry. It's independent of the chemistry. 
But they, again, they just flat out, they just deny it. Deny, deny, deny. It's like, uh, they're just like petulant Charles. It is. So anyway, in fact, here's the quote from the, uh, from the atheists. Anything that has two or more variations can store information. Tree rings. We're back to tree rings. Can store information. What does that have to do with whether or not the DNA molecule can store the OS operating system? Tree ring can't store the OS operating system. Not without us as a brain doing it for them. What do you think? Okay, and so here's some other comments, and so now I'm going to be getting into comments. So they wrote, depending on whether you think viruses are alive, like I said, doesn't matter what I think, does it? And dumbing down life to fit what you want is nonsense. It is. You're dumbing down life like they do everything else. You dumb down God and you soup up nothing. <laughs> you do. Carl Sagan, a virus is a thoroughgoing parasite. We've already covered that. So again, in uh, my video, the first post, Carl Sagan and the Science Channel both put DNA, not a virus, in the first cell. Okay, so... Then we got into, okay, maybe it's a different molecule, so they wanted to bring up RNA. Why do they want to bring up RNA? Well, RNA is a molecule that can carry information, but as I just showed you earlier, and it's not my study, I didn't make it up, it lasts two minutes. Then we got to talking about one of the, one of the people, uh, I think it was last night, they, they said, well, uh, there are viruses, you know, RNA basically based viruses that, you know, will last 48 hours on a surface or something like that. I said, okay, I'll give you 48 hours. I'll give you 48 hours to put together a cell. You got 48 hours to do it in. <laughs> and that's what my point was. Um, like I said here in the video, would it just, you know, once you've got the, the RNA molecule, so you get the RNA molecule, however you get it, whether it comes in on meteors, whether it uh, self-assembles, I don't care, whatever it does, would it simply just meander across the surface of the earth just looking for all the other components of the cell? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And when I asked that question, you know what they did? It's called deflection. There are different types of RNA, friend tRNA, blah, blah, blah. And that's all they did. They talked about the different types of RNA. Whatever. <laughs> now, here's one of the biggest uh, hand waves of the whole debate. I said, so you actually believe haphazardly arranged code in the first DNA molecule built the cell. Okay, them. No, RNA likely built the first cell. And the haphazard part would have long gone by the time the first cell appeared. This would be because something similar to evolution. Now, in the biological sense, happens with chemistry. Now, get this right. Listen, listen. Now, this is what they think could happen, right? And I'm going to show you that that is absolutely, positively impossible. All right. Me. This is my, my thing. How much, I was asking the question, how much is DNA like a language or a code? Them. It sends chemical messages and causes to happen various outcomes. That's it. But that's not what either of language or code is in the way you to want to talk about them. Language is a code, and all genuine codes have a few things in common. First, they're arbitrary. Well, <laughs> what nonsense. Arbitrary. What's, the, what's the, the definition of arbitrary? Based on random choice or personal whim rather than any reason or system. Uh, that's not what a book is. You know, that's not what uh, a thousand books, Carl Sagan said, a thousand, a thousand volumes are in a, in a DNA cell of an amoeba, by the way, a thousand volumes. And you're going to tell me that's random? Really? Y you, could go, you could store a thousand volumes of Cyclopedia Britannica, by the way, and I, if I could, if I could, and we can, apparently we can, we can get in there and download it. If I could download it, uh, it should be a thousand volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica, not um, something at the whim or random. Hmm. Okay. So like I said here, yeah, sure. Building a child between the, fr from the DNA of the two parents, building a child, well, you know, if you're not careful, you could come out with a puppy. That's the way they make it sound. And that's exactly what they want you to believe. And I wasn't, I was not joking in the last video, but 
I wasn't quite serious, but now I'm quite serious. That's exactly what they think. They actually think where I, t I talked about how, you know, it's a little girl up on the blackboard and, uh, you know, DNA, the, 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 the information in DNA is like, and she's just, you know, she's got a couple letters here and maybe the word the, and then it's gibberish. They actually believe that. They actually believe that's true. That's what they talked about. Well, anyway, the in the, the original video of the first one, the video that I showed of the gentleman with, uh, no, of the second one, I'm sorry, the second video on the comments. Uh, anyway, he said that the ones and zeros of the digital world, he used the term totally interchangeable. <laughs> and this is what she wrote, they, I'm sorry, they wrote, all, chemi all chemistry works that way, not just DNA. All chemistry can be brought into a computer, worked out, arranged, and then spit out as a new chemical. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought it was all arbitrary, random. Hmm. And this is what I also wrote. Now, that's a, that is, that's a colossal misdirection. That is a colossal misdirection. And this is the crux of the problem. We're not talking about table salt or simple chemistry, two chemicals, you know, having a chemical reaction, three chemicals having a chemical reaction, who cares? We're talking about the actual information that is stored along the spine. And I don't care whether you want to use DNA or RNA. There is information stored in that molecule. How do I know? You guys said it did, <laughs> man. Uh, we're not talking about just the simple arrangement of substances. We're not talking about just chemistry. Okay, and so again, I used her analogy. I said, in this particular substance, even DNA, as we've, I've already shown, we could store the Windows operating system. Okay, so anyway, it's all nonsense. And then the story continues. And it... <laughs> I really appreciate this stuff. I really do. I really appreciate them putting this stuff out here. Uh, but in this in this instance, I gave them an RNA. Okay, I said, okay, let's start with an RNA. I'll give you, in fact, I'll give you a fully programmed RNA, RNA molecule that could then create the next cell. That's how far I was willing to go. Well, then here's their story, right? I say, like I say here in the video, let's play who's your daddy, okay? Let's all play who's your daddy. Well, first, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an RNA molecule. This is what they wrote. It'd likely be trillions of the things. Okay, I admit, that's likely wrong. It's likely way more than that given. Wow, really, trillions of things. Well, in, isn't that interesting? Trillions of things. How easy they be. How, and, and I like the way they do this. And every, they always do this, easy they use the word easy. They use the word simple. You guys are going right down my the the. You guys are going right down the the uh, the book your your book that you guys always use. Easy. They be to form on hot clay. From that point on, it'd be like it would be like replicate in small ponds, which was the wonderful advantage of concentrating bunches of needed minerals all in one spot and allows for wetting dry cycles. It can also help with the formations of polymers. The cell wouldn't be then the result of a single thing, but rather it, it looks like much of the individual bits had their own separate existence. Okay, now listen, remember that, separate existence before coming part of a single cell and were incorporated into one pulled in another. Oh, each one pulled in the other, right? Okay, we haven't got life yet, so nobody knows what life is yet, but it pulled in another, okay. <laughs> or maybe it would be pseudo-involved, it pseudo-evolved various bits. What the heck does pseudo-evolved mean? You mean pseudo-science evolved? <laughs> And then she said, I never said it. we have all the answers. In fact, you don't have any of the answers here. There are none of the answers here. But, the, but here's, here's their thing. But the very fact that we have an information-bearing molecule that can form entirely naturally, even forming change naturally, that can act as genetic material and can catalyze its own re replication means that we're really down to asking the specific path it took. <laughs> then she gives a weird example. I don't care. Uh, then I said, and I mean this, you guys need a course in, in the second law of thermodynamics. You need to watch the first video of my series where Brian Cox talks about a sand pile versus a sand castle. And how come when you go to the beach, you, if you go to the beach and you see a sand castle, you know somebody made that? Well, you know what the example is? It's just like her example. In, in other words, at the top of this uh, quote here, it says, I'd li it, it'd likely be trillions of the same things, or it's likely way more than that. 
<laughs> well, if you go watch the video from Brian Cox, and I'll leave, a I'll leave it in the description below, he gives an example of a sand pile and a sand castle. And why do you, when you go down to the beach, you know that if you see a sand castle, you know somebody did that. Why? Because of the second law of thermodynamics and because of the trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of other ways that the sand pile is more likely, meaning less order, you're, you are violating the second law of thermodynamics and you are violating it in the most outrageous way I have ever seen in my life. You need to watch the video, but I'll bet any amount of money you won't. Oh, man. So anyway, so here's some more of, their, of what they talked about. But the very fact that we have an information-bearing molecule, RNA, and that's their quote, that can form entirely naturally. So that's what they say, it can form entirely naturally, forming change naturally, it can act as a genetic material, it can catalyze its own replication, wow. <laughs> and they never tell you how much of it. And I'll bet you it gets you hardly anything compared to what you need. So um, I just said, look, would you read what you wrote, please? That story. Mother Nature is, Mother Nature is a deadhead beast. It's got no feelings. It's got no concept of RNA for that matter. In fact, for that matter, the RNA molecule. And it's fully programmed by me is also dead. It's a deadhead. It doesn't understand anything. All you did, and you did, all you did was recite a stupid fairy tale of how the RNA molecule just might have performed with trillions and trillions. Well, again, Brian Cox says that would never happen, uh, not just the molecule. And I'm telling you. Okay, so just because an RNA can be programmed with the information, you skipped over the most important part, too. You're talking about the assembly of an RNA molecule, but you never talk about where does the specific instructions on the RNA molecule come from to make the next cell. You know where it came from in this case? Me, I granted it to you. I gave you an RNA molecule and I said, well, I'll program it, I'll pre-program it with all the information the RNA needs to create the cell. Uh, that's intelligence. <laughs> the, the previous part of your just so story, the previous part, all the stuff that was in there, it's, it's only dealing with get, getting the physical molecules, molecules and pieces together, getting them into the right place. But, you know, RNA has no idea what they are. RNA has no idea how much code is needed, how much information is needed so that it can replicate the next cell. It has no idea of any of that. It's all hogwash and apparently not subject to the second law. In fact, here's the other thing. Based on your story, it would take thousands of years to magically and chance alone build each piece. And all the other pieces would be dead before the next one was built. RNA molecule lasts for only two minutes. But again, I gave her 48 hours. So I said this, you got 48 hours to get your stuff together. And even with the brain, even with a brain, you can't do it. You can't put one of those together. But you actually believe a brain dead don't care Mother Nature could. It's all hogwash. You can believe all that garbage if you want, but that's hogwash. The RNA molecule has no concept of quote, what the rest of the cell needs. You believe in fairy tales, I'm telling you. Well, now me, guess what? I believe in a Sky Daddy Jesus. I believe in Sky Daddy Jesus. I believe in an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent being who created that little cell and made it a trillion times more complex than the space shuttle. And by the way, that's exactly, exactly what is more reasonable. reasonable. It is. It's more reasonable to believe in this situation, period. Way better than what you've got. And now I want to thank you for one other thing. You gave me another proof for God. And you say, what? I say, yeah, you gave me another proof for God. Another one. Okay, here's, here's a quote from those guys. 
Humans have about 3 billion base pairs of DNA. It varies from person to person by a few thousand at least, from what I remember, but it might be a couple of million, one way or the other, and yet there are species out there with more, than, more DNA than we have, more base pairs than we have. An amoeba protist. Now, notice where she went. <laughs> An amoeba, for instance, hovers around 290 billion. And the common toad is about 7 billion. So clearly it's not the case that this operates like instructions. And here, here's, the, here's the stab against God. But it actually is a stab against your own theory. Un unless the one writing this is really, really devastatingly bad. Devastatingly bad. Except the theory of evolution says this. Well, wait a minute. I thought we're all related to a common ancestor and all that rubbish. That's what you guys keep saying. We're related to a common ancestor. So shouldn't we basically all be the same? Wow. You know, homology. You remember homology where it says that uh, some an anatomical features thus indicating a common ancestor? So we have a common ancestor and yet we're also different? Well, that's not proof of evolution. That's proof of a creation and a creator who could... Yes, create anything he wants with as much DNA as he wants, as he chooses. And evolution says we came from all from a common ancestor. So we should all be basically the same. That's what homology is all about. You guys have so many inconsistencies in this thing. It's amazing. What again? What do I have on my side? An omniscient, omnipotent creator, an omnipresent creator that can do all of this. And he can do it any way he likes. He's not constrained. You know who the one is who's constrained? You guys are. You guys are the ones that are constrained, not me. <laughs> oh, man, that's, a, that's too bad for you. Well, so conclusion. My opponents, they do. They give you the impression that uh, we don't know how to define life anymore. We don't know how to define life. Uh, and, and I know why they do that. They can't, they can't define life now because of the complexity that they're finding. It is too complex, even at the cellular level, to be by chance alone. The first cell was by chance alone. Nope, the atheist, material, seven evolutionist has to define the word, redefine it now. And they have to somehow wiggle their way. I haven't heard a good one yet. Uh, a good definition of what, quote, life is anymore. Why do they do all of this? One word, complexity. <laughs> Even the simplest, smallest form of life that can live on its own, I'm qualifying it, that can uh, replicate on its own is a trillion times more complex than the space shuttle. So once again, and I predict this in my first one, that the atheist evolutionist materialists would muddy the waters, they misdirect, they deny standard uh, definitions. Oh, and they even claim that a haphazard, haphazard means random, randomized code could build macromolecules. And that not only happened, but then those, those, and again, all you have is the RNA molecule. That was one thing. You only have the RNA molecule. You haven't got to the rest of the cell. You've got the RNA molecule. That's what that little story was all about, except then these pieces that supposedly survived over millions of years and there was trillions of combinations. It's all hogwash. It's all hogwash. I, <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. But they swirled around and, and built the first RNA molecule. Okay, so you built the first RNA molecule and they don't know how, but it also just so happened to have the millions of lines of information needed to replicate itself for the next cell. Mm -hmm. Sure it did. That's a fairy tale for grown-ups. That's a very good fairy tale for grown-ups, and it's getting worse by the day. So back to this. Do you remember this little quote? For unsubstantiated, just so stories, we have a prior commitment. We are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Man, I'll tell you what, I've never been initiated into this thing. It's, it is total hogwash. So let me ask you again, Mr. Atheist, who's your daddy? Is the little RNA your daddy? Well, 
I'll keep Sky Daddy Jesus. I love Sky Daddy Jesus. Enough said. Have a blessed day. Bye.